Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Work by Verdi. <clears throat> it would have to be, well, you had lots of choices for this one, but a bunch of you hit the nail on the head. It's Rigoletto. It has to be Rigoletto. Why? Well, it is true that in later Verdi, you may claim that there is greater refinement, greater textual something, stuff, and whatnot, <laughs> whatever you want to claim, claim it, that Otello and Falstaff are the two greatest Shakespeare operas ever written, that Aida is the perfect grand opera, that Verdi, Verdi sort of elevated all of the forms that he worked in, whether they were Italian, whether they were French. I mean, you know, even even if they were German. Well, maybe sometimes. Depends what it was, doesn't it? But Rigoletto is, in its way, as revolutionary a work as Wagner's Ring was. It really is. First of all, it's a lot shorter. Yay. But, you know, it comes at a time, it was written at the same time as Das Rheingold. And, you know, it's one of a trilogy, a trilogy of operas. They're separate works. It's not one big giant conglomerate. But they still sort of set the stage for everything that was going to come later. And they summarize all of the wonderfulness of Italian opera that had come before. And how does it do that? Well, first of all, Rigoletto is wonderfully scored. Um, in the Italian manner, you know, you've got colorful tunes, just amazingly set off with incredible vocal writing, thrilling characterization. Oh my God! I mean, is there has there ever been a baritone role to compare with that of Rigoletto? I mean, it's the role, and you know, all of the characters are really finely drawn, wonderfully drawn. You know, Gilda, who's in love with a jerk and willing to die for it because she's young and she's innocent and idealistic. And, and Rigoletto himself, who's tormented and, 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 you know, loving on the one hand and vicious and nasty on the other hand. I mean, even the chorus, I mean, the chorus has its own personality. It's a malicious, spiteful, obnoxious presence throughout the opera. It's great. It's just, I mean, the Duke, yeah, he's a cad. He's just a cad. It's true. But he's, he's a focused cad. He's kind of understandably atrocious. It's, it's just amazing. Amazing. And yeah, what other opera has a third act like this one, where you get, you know, one of the greatest tunes in Western civilization, La Donna e Mobile, and then you get Bella Filia de Amore, you know, you got the quartet, and you've got the storm building around it with the moaning chorus, which was the, the clear model for the snoring chorus in Wozzeck, or, or the scene in Act One between Rigoletto and Sparafucile, the assassin, which was the obvious influence on the muted double bass solo in the funeral march of Mahler's first symphony. Mahler knew his Rigoletto. He knew his Verdi very much. I did a video on it. You may want to take a look. It's a fascinating topic. You know, we, we look at our, our, and judge music in terms of nationalistic categories and national schools. But the reality is totally different. Because in the 19th century, Wagner was not popular and was impractical to perform and not often heard at all. And what people saw was Italian opera. And what composers heard was Italian opera. And what Mahler conducted was Italian opera. And so this is the stuff that influenced them. And, and Rigoletto was a thing apart in the world of Italian opera, of a mastery and imaginative daring that had never yet occurred. Even the very first scene, which is 20 minutes of absolutely continuous music, as fluent as any scene that Wagner ever wrote. I mean, it really is a remarkable achievement, but it is still stylistically totally Italianate in its focus on the voice, in its immediacy of effect, in its lack of philosophical pretense. Yay.
just a, a work of astonishing genius. And I know, I love Aida. It was my first opera. I adore it. It's perfect, perfectly fabulous. I love Otello. I love Falstaff. But I also love Simone Bocanegra. I mean, I love Macbeth. I love Don Carlos. There, there's so much to choose from with Verdi. There really is. You can, you can, you know, even some of the earliest pieces, Nabucco, which is just thrilling. The thing about Verdi is that he is the most honest composer who ever lived. You know, there's, 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 there's nothing that comes between him and the direct expression of feeling in the text. And because of that, his operas just have this, this, this visceral sense of, of, of direct communication that I think very few composers match. And I, I just, you know, picking one is tough. It really is tough, especially from this middle period. Should it be Il Trovatore? Should it be La Traviata? Which are very, very different pieces, all in their own specific style. Verdi, you know, always attempted to realize what he called the tinta, the atmosphere of the story, and to and to create the the work, you know, the, the structure and the orchestration, its sound, its feeling around the unique elements of the story. And from his middle period on, that's all he did. And it's an unbelievable achievement. So picking one is tough. It was very, very tough. But I think at the end of the day, Rigoletto sums up everything that he could do that nobody else could do in the most cogent, gut-punching, moving, dramatic, and exciting way. So there you go, friends. That's my choice. The one work to be saved from the apocalypse in which the evil god of music, Ken Krasanz, is going to destroy everything but for one work by each composer. It would have to be Rigoletto that we save from the conflagration. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.